On today's Ask Dr. Bitcoin, Ripple. This is the definitive Ripple episode. I'm always asked, should I buy Ripple? Unless you're a bank, the answer is no. Wanna know why? Stay tuned. Well, hello there, I'm Mark Risen Hopkins. I'm a blockchain and cryptocurrency enthusiast who's been studying and learning about the space going back to 2011. There's been a lot of news recently about Ripple and a lot of interesting uh, new companies are deciding to adopt it, including Western Union has just confirmed in the last 24 hours that they are testing transactions using the Ripple protocol. Uh, in the past, there's been announcements from uh, banks out in India making massive uh, leaps forward with Ripple, including Bank of New York, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, Santander, and all these, these announcements might give one pause and to wonder whether or not that means Ripple's a great investment. So today we're gonna to talk about what Ripple is, how it works, and why that may not necessarily be the case, just because they've got a lot of customers, why it's not necessarily a great investment to buy the utility token Ripple. Today's project profile is Ripple. We're gonna talk about how the protocol works uh, and then we're gonna probably go into some more details as to how the, the relationship between the token and everything else works. So, But the, the, the key technology is something called XCurrent. But to understand how XCurrent works, you're gonna to have to understand how bank transactions work. Now, if you are going to do a wire transfer from you know your Bank of America or Capital One or some, some similar sort of account to somebody domestically, there's still a lot of manual steps that have to take place. Ripple uh, is not really geared towards domestic wire transfers, uh, but they can, it could be implied for that. It's more geared towards international wire transfers because as com complex as a domestic transfer is, uh, an international transfer is even more complex because the process includes uh, you know, filling out the recipients and usually giving a personal address uh, of both the bank and the recipient and filling in account numbers and routing numbers. That's all done essentially on paper, and then it's taken on paper to uh, an individual somewhere in the bank, the wire manager, who then types this information up and throws it into a, a SWIFT settlement system or an ACH settlement system or one of the other uh, various protocols, which is a fancy way of saying typing in a text document and uploading it via FTP to an intermediary bank. An intermediary bank is the bank that that bank will deal with that will liquid uh, will move the liquid funds from one bank to another. These are all kind of uh, electronic processes, sure, but they're manually operated and manually verified. As a result, it's very expensive even for local bank branches to uh, operate uh, wire transfers, which is why a bank will probably charge you no less than 35 bucks to wire domestically and even more to wire internationally. So as you can see, I've got this video here playing that talks about how Ripple kind of streamlines that process. What it does is it's got all those different protocols and basically text file formats built into its protocol and it reads it from a, a higher level app that would be deployed by the bank in question. It, it asks the user for the information or pulls it from the bank account information and then it'll calculate the Ripple network, the X current protocol will calculate what all the intermediary banks are between point A and point B. And then it'll find out, you know, what type of uh, liquid, liquid uh, asset management they're using. Is it going to be from a liquidity provider? Is it going to be from an intermediary bank? Is it going to be from all the different banking technical terms that you and I have no business knowing anything about? And then it'll place a hold on them. And then after it places a hold, it will then reflect on both sides, hey, uh, the, the, uh, the liquidity has been found for this transfer, and person A and person B, A being the person sending, the recipient being person B, will see in their screens that the transaction has gone through, payment is confirmed, funds are released. That's what XCurrent does. That was kind of the uh, what happens in the moment of settlement, in the moment a transaction is initiated. This other video, and this is another great explanatory video put out by Ripple where they show it what it looks like from the user experience perspective. Like you're in your online banking app, you're deciding you're wanting to send some uh, money to somebody. So you fill out the information for that individual, whether it be an address that's native to that application or it's some sort of uh, routing number, account number combination. That takes place there. You put in your amount, you put in the destination and the, the transaction kind of takes place. And in the, here they're demonstrating international transfers. So in the back end of this app, 
the UX kind of hides these calculations from the user and just gives them the end result of how much money is being uh, transmitted, what the exchange rates are, what the fees are, and it all just kind of calculates at the kind of the application layer. And then, uh, and then once everything is agreed to by the sender, uh, they hit the send button there and then it, it kind of goes through that settlement layer process that we looked at with the X current protocol uh, explanation and graphs there. So um, as you can see, uh, this is actually a pretty slick system. If you're a bank, you're going to love this, right? Because it's taking out of the equation um, not just the, 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 the physical bodies, the two or three physical bodies at the branch level that have to deal with wire transfers, it puts it out on the electronic level, but all those people that have to be involved that are prone to human error at the intermediary bank level or at the liquidity bank provider level. The, all these people uh, no longer have to be physically involved in the process. It's all handled by an overlay protocol. One thing you may be wondering about, though, is uh, where's the token come into all this? Very briefly, the token is, uh, is, is, is just the payment mechanism for using the X-Current messaging protocol. Uh, in very much the same way, whenever you launch a smart contract on Ethereum or you launch a token on Ethereum, you've got to pay for it with Ethereum. On the Ripple protocol, when you use their messaging protocol, you have to, uh, you have to pay for it with Ripple. What impact does all this have on the economics of the token? Stay tuned and find out. Today I'm gonna to talk about the market fundamentals that drive the value of Ripple. Usually we spend a little bit of time of this in our project profiles, but I really wanted to expand on this because it's really a commonly asked question and it's commonly misunderstood. Most people view all cryptocurrencies as the same in terms of how their market fundamentals intrinsically work. And in general, that's a safe assumption, but with Ripple, uh, we're really talking about something that's application specific. Uh, but let's back away for just a second. Um, there's a quote that I like to bandy about. Uh, Max Kaiser has, has, has put it out there as well as it kind of originally came from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Uh, Chairman Emeritus uh, Leo Melamud. Bitcoin and cryptocurrency represent perhaps the first new asset class in hundreds of years. And the reason why they say that is because there are aspects of most cryptocurrencies that represent a currency, uh, a security, a commodity, uh, a utility token. There's a lot of things that are a lot of things uh, in terms of the cryptocurrency world, and it's difficult to kind of peg them into one uh, category. That's important uh, to understand, mostly if you're a regulator, if you're a government regulator, you want to know whose responsibility is this. But uh, it's also important if you want to understand the real driving factors behind the value of different uh, tokens and coins. If you look at Bitcoin, for instance, which has the longest track record, obviously, you can uh, f do a fun little experiment at home. We'll, maybe we'll do the graphics here on the screen to kind of show you what I'm saying. Go to bitcoinity.org uh, and look at the markets. Uh, you can switch to over to Bitstamp and see what the price of Bitcoin has been. And then what else? What I also want you to do is go to Google Trends. It's a it's a place where you can see the the how how popular a search term is. Go into Google Trends and type in the word Bitcoin, and then I want you to put both of those graphs side by side. And what you'll find is the best leading indicator for Bitcoin's value is its popularity amongst the public, which is a good proxy for the number of people that are trying to find out about Bitcoin and trying to use Bitcoin. As of this recording, uh, there is an estimated 33 million Bitcoin users on the Bitcoin network, and that is the reason why we've seen this monumental growth throughout 2017. We'll probably continue throughout 2018. When you hold a Bitcoin and when you transfer Bitcoin as a, as a means of exchanging value, you are bol bolstering the value of the coin because it's just standard economics, scarcity and demand. And, uh, you know, when you want something that isn't there, want something that's scarce, it drives the value up of what is available for purchase. Ripple, of course, is also governed by market dynamics, but the value of Ripple is not contained and uh, by it is not represented by the protocol itself. The value of Ripple is the protocol is, is the, the messaging protocol. The token um, is almost ancillary to that. In fact, the more expensive the token, 
the less valuable Ripple as a protocol is. And let me explain that. So at the top of the show, I mentioned a couple of early adopters of Ripple, Deutsche Bank and Bank of New York. Let's say you're those guys. Let's say you're already dealing with expensive bureaucrats that have to fill out paper and walk it from one section to another. You're subject to human error. Ripple is a clear value proposition for you because it cuts the cost. But what if the cost of a single Ripple jumps up to Bitcoin-like numbers? If it goes up to 10000 it goes up to $100,000 per Bitcoin, as it's predicted to do in the near future. Uh, so what if Ripple costs like that? Then the cost for using your messaging protocol, supposedly to save costs, suddenly jumps up in value, which would turn the value of Ripple into a bug, not a feature. You don't want Ripple to cost a lot if you're a user. And so that's why, if you look at the market dynamics, the economics of this coin, there's a hundred billion ripple, the vast majority of which are not in the circulating supply. The circulating supply of ripple is only 30 million. The rest are being held by the company or being held in trust or ready to be sold to new customers as they come online. Now the market interprets these new customers coming online and these new acquisitions of large uh, amounts of ripple as a buy signal, but it's not because the scarcity really isn't being impacted. And the, you know, whenever these banks do use the Ripple, it goes back into the company coffers. It goes back because the Ripple, as a company, controls the majority of the mining network. So they're making money when banks use Ripple. It is within Ripple, as an organization's best interest, to keep the cost of a token low, to keep it affordable and manageable. Not too below, not too low, because they actually they want to have some value themselves to spend on things, but they want to keep it low enough so that it's valuable enough for banks to use as a uh, cost-saving measure against the current way of doing things. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's the exact opposite. Everybody in Bitcoin, everybody in Ethereum generally has an incentive to, to use it, transfer value onto the blockchain, and uh, increase the wealth of everybody involved. Just, just in the same way that people that have gold have a vested interest in increasing the value of gold by hoarding it or saving it or doing other things with it. That's the key differentiation between Ripple and Bitcoin and any other cryptocurrency, is the value does not travel through the blockchain. US dollars are all that's being exchanged using the Ripple, mo Ripple protocol. It does not transfer into Ripple at any point and then out of Ripple whenever a bank uses Ripple. They're simply moving money dollars from one bank to another and using the Ripple messaging protocol to coordinate it and paying for the usage of that messaging protocol with Ripple tokens. Cannot be reiterated enough. I'm gonna re say that one more time just so you understand this is the key thing that most people get tripped up on. The value of Ripple does not go up when a bank makes a transfer to another bank using the Ripple network. It actually uh, will stay relatively the same. They're spending a trivial amount of Ripple tokens to, to send USD from one bank to another bank that maybe wants it in EUR and the tra value never travels into the blockchain itself. The blockchain is only used to pay for the transfer. Well, there you have it, your blockchain and cryptocurrency prescription. As always, these are just my thoughts and I encourage you to seek out a second opinion. Subscribe for more videos on blockchain and cryptocurrency. And if you enjoyed today's video, share with a friend so they can see. Thanks for watching and don't forget to see the receptionist on your way out.